Welcome. Today, I'm going to be speaking to you about postpartum depression, what every clinician should know. Here is a disclaimer liability slide that please spend a few moments to review. These are my financial disclosures for the past three years in terms of being a consultant, serving as a research advisor on the Speakers Bureau or as a shareholder. These are the learning objectives of the talk. We're gonna take a look at the signs and symptoms of PPD. We will look at screening instruments, potential etiology, prevalence, and then evidence-based treatments for PPD. Here is an outline of the talk. We're gonna start off with prevalence and move on to management and prevention of PPD. Let me say a few words about postpartum depression. The postpartum period is a very challenging period, a transitional period for mothers, particularly those with a history of psychiatric illness. Baby blues are very common in this period and can occur in up to 80% of mothers after delivery. However, only one in five mothers with baby blues will go on to develop postpartum depression. Unfortunately, postpartum depression is often missed, diagnosed too late, thereby adversely affecting the mother and the child, including interfering with bonding. We also know that maternal postpartum depression is a risk factor for paternal postpartum depression that can lead to marital conflicts, feelings of isolation, and problems interacting with the child. Now in DSM-5, which is the diagnostic system for psychiatric illness, postpartum depression is major depression. Patients have to meet the criteria for major depression, five out of nine symptoms for two weeks. The only difference is there is a peripartum specifier that you have to say because these symptoms have occurred either during pregnancy or four weeks postpartum. In postpartum depression, anxiety and panic attacks are extremely common. In terms of etiology, we're not quite certain what causes PPD but some people argue it may be an inability to upregulate the GABA-A receptors quickly in the postpartum period. We also know that there is a rapid fall in the estrogen and progesterone levels from pregnancy in the postpartum period, and that may be another factor that may be responsible. So how common is PPD around the world? The best meta-analysis was done by Shori et al. from the National University of Singapore, published in the Journal of Psychiatric Research a few years ago, and they looked at 58 studies involving more than 37,000 mothers. The interesting part about this meta-analysis is they excluded studies where mothers had a history of psychiatric illness or a history of postpartum depression. So the studies were only done in mothers without a history of psychiatric illness. They found that the global prevalence of PPD was 17%, the incidence was 12%, the highest rates in the Middle East, the lowest rates in Europe. Interestingly, they did not find like previous studies that age was a risk factor for PPD or parity, multi-paris versus primi-paris or marital status, married versus single mothers were risk factors for PPD. They did not find that in this meta-analysis. And finally, they did not find that it mattered what screening tool you use, whether you use the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale, which we uh, know is one of the best validated scales for PPD, whether they use the Hamilton Rating Scale, the PHQ-9 didn't matter. The global prevalence was still the same. Now, there have been other meta-analyses, such as the one done by Hahn and Holbrook in 2018, where they included studies where the mothers had a history of psychiatric illness or a history of postpartum depression. And they looked at 291 studies and found a prevalence of PPD of 17.7%. This is different than the Shori meta-analysis where they excluded mothers with a history of psychiatric illness. The other thing to keep in mind is postpartum depression patients often have comorbidity. Two thirds of them can have an anxiety disorder, 70% of them may have had major depression in the past, and one in five may actually have a bipolar disorder. 
In fact, bipolar disorder is often missed in postpartum depression. Postpartum depression is a risk factor for bipolar disorder. Always screen every woman with postpartum depression for hypomania or mania using a screener. I'm going to be discussing one we've developed called the rapid mood screener. And finally, only 40% of episodes of postpartum depression begin during the postpartum period. A third of them begin during pregnancy, which is why the DSM-5 specifier is peripartum specifier, not a postpartum specifier. And 27% can begin even before pregnancy. Now we saw that the prevalence of PPD in the Shori meta-analysis was around 17%. But those were patients without a history of psychiatric illness. What happens if you have a history of major depression in the past or a history of postpartum depression in the past? Your risk for postpartum depression in subsequent pregnancies is higher. If you had postpartum depression in the past, your risk of a subsequent PPD is 40%. If you had major depression in the past, your risk of postpartum depression is 30%. So much higher. Now, different studies have used different screening tools for PPD. As I mentioned, DSM-5 says PPD is major depression. So you could use a PHQ-9. You could use a Hamilton rating scale for depression, a MADRIS. But the best validated tool is called the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale, the EPDS. And here you can see it has 10 items. And I'm going to show you in just a moment how you score these items but this is a good scale which is freely available to use in patients to screen them for postpartum depression here is the screening scoring for the epds questions one two and four are scored zero one two three with the top box being zero and the bottom box being three and questions three and five six seven eight nine ten are reverse scored so the top box is scored as a three and the bottom box is scored as a zero. The maximum score is 30. And if the EPDS score is 10 or greater, it's thought to have a very high sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing postpartum depression. Always look for the suicidal thoughts item number 10. If you remember, I said earlier, bipolar disorder is a very common illness, misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed in women with postpartum depression. And the best way not to miss it is to screen every woman with depression for mania or hypomania. And our group just recently published a screener called the Rapid Mood Screener in the journal Current Medical Research and Opinion is freely available, open access, no cost. You can download it. And this screener only has six items. The mood disorder questionnaire, which was used before, 15 items, takes five to seven minutes. Our screener takes less than two minutes. You can see the six questions. If you score four plus on the screen of four items, positive or more, it has a very high sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing bipolar disorder. You can use this even in patients without postpartum depression. In regular patients with major depression, you can screen them for bipolar disorder using the rapid mood screener, which takes less than two minutes. So as I said at the start, postpartum period is a challenging transition for mothers, particularly those with psychiatric illness. And it's often referred to as the fourth trimester, the 12 months after delivery. And you can see some of the adaptations mothers have to make. There's a new self-identity. They are being judged for their competence to be a mother. There are emotional challenges. They often have to take time off their job. So this is a very challenging period for many mothers. Let me say a few words about the management of PPD. Specific psychotherapies like CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, interpersonal psychotherapy can sometimes be helpful, but for moderate to severe depression, patients may need antidepressants or FDA approved treatments. The only FDA approved treatment for postpartum depression, at least available in the US, is a medicine called Brexanolon. And I'm going to show you some data for that. If you use an antidepressant, sertraline is preferred. If the mother is breastfeeding, fluoxetine is an option if the mother does not want to breastfeed. 
but you have to discuss the risk benefit ratio. So Brexanolon is the only FDA approved treatment for postpartum depression. It's available in the US. It's a neuroactive steroid, which is given intravenously as a 60 hour infusion, usually in a healthcare facility. It's thought to be a positive allosteric modulator of the GABA-A receptors and increases neuronal inhibition by GABA. It does not directly affect the monoaminergic systems, but it also may have some effects on the HPA axes. So there are two positive trials. The drug is given as an intravenous infusion. Improvements were seen uh, as early as 60 hours. The side effect profile was relatively benign, but it does have a REMS program where the patient has to be observed for excessive sedation and loss of consciousness uh, after the infusion and during the infusion. Mothers will often ask you, what about breastfeeding? Sertraline is the preferred antidepressant if the mother wants to breastfeed. Typically, we recommend breastfeeding uh, eight to nine hours after the patient has taken the sertraline. Uh, fluoxetine is an option if the mother does not want to breastfeed. You have to consider other factors also, uh, the severity of the psychiatric illness, prior treatment response. Uh, there is a very excellent website called womensmentalhealth.org run by my colleagues at the Massachusetts General Hospital at Harvard Medical School, where I trained, which is the best resource for finding out which medicines to use in pregnancy postpartum period, womensmentalhealth.org. So please use that as a resource. As we saw earlier, Brexanolon is the only FDA approved treatment for postpartum depression, but it has to be given intravenously, which is inconvenient. So now they are developing an oral neuroactive steroid called Zuranolon, for which there is already one positive phase three study called the Robin study, where patients were better at the end of two weeks, which was the primary endpoint, and different doses were studied it was well tolerated. Uh, somnolence, headache, and dizziness were some of the common side effects. But Zuranolon is oral. And there is a second study which we await the results of called the Skylark study. And if both studies are positive, then they will file for FDA approval for Zuranolon for PPD. Zuranolon is also being studied for major depression. There's already one positive study, and we are awaiting a second study called the Waterfall study. And if that's positive, then hopefully it will also be available for major depression, not just PPD. So let me conclude with some pearls about treating postpartum depression. Do not miss the diagnosis. Use a scale. The Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale is an excellent scale. Do not stop the antidepressant during pregnancy. Do not decrease the dose. Treat the postpartum depression aggressively if it moves beyond the baby blues if they do have postpartum depression, continue the antidepressant for at least one year. In women with a history of major depression or postpartum depression, plan in advance. If they've had a prior episode, use a medicine that was effective in prior episodes if they get it again. Brexanolon is the only FDA approved treatment for postpartum depression. CBT and IPT may be helpful in some women with mild to moderate PPD. ECT is always an option as is ketamine. Uh, which can be used in treatment-resistant patients. So I'd like to thank you for joining me today.